a soul of subtlety and most of all an electronic mind capable of making millions of calculations, analyzing billions of possible outcomes, and, and of being programmed. That's what Perdita's job was for nothing but training for a larger goal, towards which she'd been mobilized this night. They reached for the scotch, ignoring the mirror's pulsing ring of cerulean flame. As she was about to bring the first shot to her lips, a black card on her desk peeped. She glared at it momentarily, then resumed her imbibing. The card beeped again. She gave up, set down the drink with a sigh, and tapped the communicator. Hey here. What is it, Sanon? Childra's gone. I can't find her anywhere. What do you mean, you can't find her anywhere? I thought she had a pager. She must have turned it off. Deity. Just what we needed. I can go myself, if you like. I can be there in that number, no. What excuse would you give? Listen, Svanon, it's P.R.D.I.D.A. we're dealing with. You've heard me speak of her. It's kind of hard not to. Then you know how insightful she is. What excuse would you give her for appearing? Well, it's a restaurant. I was hungry. It's past midnight, and they close at eleven. Try again. I am the head of a... Hey. What could be more natural than the department investigating attack burst? Considering it's the KF, you should count yourself fortunate they haven't thought of that yet. If they realize you're on to them, all will be shut down faster than you can say search warrant. No, Sanon. It's too risky for you to go. Children might have pulled it off, with her past experience, but you... I understand, but is there really another option? They took a deep breath. She was very unwilling to do this, to paraphrase the entrepreneur. A hand played was a hand lost one should always keep one's isses hidden until the last moment. However, she was running short of moments. There is. I have. Someone I can send out. Who? You'll find out soon enough. Join me in the commerce basement we can view the transmissions here. Understood. I'll be there in five minutes. The communicator went silent, and Tay sank back into her leather chair, touching the tips of her fingers together and looking at the ceiling, lost in thought. The mirror's flame intensified, then subsided into a dull glow. Makeful and an understanding shampoo's broken Japanese was a difficult task, at the best of times. When she was puzzled, flustered, and waving her arms about, it was nearly impossible. What did you say? Asked Ranma. Children and rat. They not here. Shampoo leave them in room. They say they wait for Ranma. They not there. Children and Rabico are gone. Shampoo nodded. I wouldn't worry too much. Why on earth not? Ranma asked. Rats a hibiki, right? Oh. He probably went looking for the toilet and ended up in Polynesia. What about children? Asked Shampoo. Maybe he, um, dragged her with him. Ranma volunteered. Kim smirked. Knowing Jansen, it's more likely that she dragged him off somewhere. Like the university's deep forest preserve. Why would she do thing like that? It late. 
Shampoo was puzzled. She couldn't see any reason why anyone would want to take a walk in the forest at one in the morning during the winter, especially when they were waiting for someone. Nice girl happens to be Miss Megahanda, explained Kim. She's my friend, too, but she has a nasty habit of betting anything with a testosterone slash estrogen ratio greater than one. Huh? Asked Grandma and Shampoo together. She likes her men. Oh. And her women, added Akhan. Shampoo blinked as Ranma visibly blushed. And we were a bit late, so... Before Thompson could finish, a red hover car landed in front of the restaurant. Who the hell is that? Wondered Shampoo. Restaurant closed. Go away, shouted the Amazon. In reply, the car's door opened and a black decked figure stepped out and walked up the front steps, not waiting for acknowledgement to open the main door. She was about Kim's height, with a thin build, and it had her dark brown hair done up in a bun. She looked once at Ranma, and smiled. I'm so glad, the newcomer said, to finally meet you. You don't know how much I've been looking forward to this. Who are you? Asked Ranma. Just outside the Nakeful and a very good question, Mr. Sodom. The girl tightened her grip around the tree and adjusted the zoom on her recorder, running her tongue habitually over her protruding canines. She took a glance at her charged meter. Still a good hour's use left in the machine. More than enough. Her superiors should be pleased with the information. Nakeful and Nakhan was shook her head rapidly, then pressed her hands against her cheeks. This can't be happening, she said. This really can't be happening. What is it? Asked Kim. Do you know her? I would hope so. She's my sister. What? Where? She was... She was killed in an explosion a long time ago. Your family just never says die, does it? Ha ha. So, why's she a ghost? Did she also kill herself? That's just it. She's not a ghost. We share a memorial. If she'd been a ghost, I would have seen her. Oh, dear. Then what? I don't know. Ranma doesn't look like he recognizes her. He wouldn't. She died 20 years after he did. Sis grew up quite a bit in that time. Should I tell him? Do it. Her name's Zabiki. Kendo Zabiki. University of Tokyo Commerce Building Basement Fanon took a key out of her pocket, slipped it into the lock before her, and opened the door. It was a full ten seconds before the gray-haired Tay acknowledged her entrance. Take a seat, Fanon, said she, swiveling her own chair to face her. Drink? You know I don't. You might. After tonight, the Hibiki scowled, but said nothing. She was quite right. A lot of things might change after tonight. If the KF had done what they feared they'd done. There's always the chance it was someone else, said the other woman. They had an unsettling habit of peeking into one's mind, and answering unvoiced thoughts. Like who? Only a handful of organizations could have access to the magic or the technology necessary for this. Someone we don't know about? Salmon took a seat on the couch, elbows on knees and hands clasped before her as a chin rest. 
Her mouth opened several times for speech, but closed again just as quickly, as each thought was rejected in turn. There were just so many variables, so many unknowns, and the things that were known were things whose implications she didn't want to think about. In time, she gave up, sat silently, looking at the gently flickering mirror. They kept her aquamarine eyes on the hibiki, all the while never shifting her position by a millimeter. What can we do? asked Fanon softly. Nothing more than we've done already, I'm afraid, at least for the moment. We can't stop them. Not unless you've found a more effective method of time travel. Unless your readings are completely off, the harm's already been done, my dear. All we can do, all we can do is mend. So you have learned something from us, after all. I'm just repeating it because I'm finding it difficult to think on my own. Right now. You haven't converted me yet, poor you. A pause. Not completely. Ah. Uh, back to business, then. Isn't it always, with you? They smiled, but otherwise ignored the comment. My operative has been sent out, and is already getting into position. We should start receiving her transmissions momentarily. Who did you say this operative was, again? Poro twitched slightly, and took a deep breath. That's a bit of a long story. Just outside the Nakeful and the girl looked away from the recorder's eyepiece briefly to brush away a brown lock of hair that had been blown before her eyes and noticed the hover car. Kunu Foundation markings? So, either she's here on business, or wants to make it look like she is. She checked her watch. It was past Perdita's shift for this day of the week. Curiouser and curiouser, she smirked. If I make not this cheap bring out another, let me be enrolled and my name put in the Book of Virtue. Nakeful and Shampi stared at the newcomer. The same hair, the same general features, but it couldn't be. She died. Hadn't she? All that Fosmus had told her about. With Ryuga, and the explosions. Ranma? Huh? How can wants to tell you something? That person there? It's... N-A-B-I-K-I. Shampoo hissed. Not anymore, said the woman. It's pretty now. What? Asked Ranma. Don't tell me you've been brought back to life. As well. As well? Pretty raised an eyebrow. What you do here? You did. And you should be. Isn't a hundred and twenty a bit old to be trying to get a husband? And to take the clone once the original's been killed? My, my. Quite the sicko you've turned out to be, Shampoo. Clone? Ranma looked at Shampoo, shock in his face. Her groom didn't actually believe that, did he? Not after all the work she'd put into the curse modification. Ranma not a clone. Ranma real. Sorry to disappoint you, said Nebiki, but Ranma died. About a century ago. I was at his cremation. Cremation? Boy, will she be surprised if she ever bumps into the church of Kodakai? Thought Ranma. Shampoo bring him back to life. You've gotten better at jigsaw puzzles, if you were able to piece back dust into a man. But, 
I don't think you have. There's a little something called Project R, and I have a feeling that this clone here, Sheep Wandat Ranma, has a great deal to do with it. Look, lady. I don't know who you are, but if Shanta says you're Nabiki, I'll take her a word for it for now. I'm not a clone, and I've never heard of this Project R. Oh, no. Then perhaps it's just a coincidence that both the Onos and the Hibikis are extremely interested in the details. You've been consorting with the Gosankuji. Consorting? Consorting? Akan's ah, voice verged on outrage, and her having for the moment taken over from shock and grief. A and D, concluded Perdida, that they've been tapping information about you directly to themselves. So that's who was draining the CKO security info, said King. But that means that this person's a KF agent. Be careful. Ranma. She's dangerous. She's my sister. Pleaded Akhan. Nabiki. Look at me. It's our enemy. Don't you see? I'm not so sure about that. Ranma answered her. What? If you're so sure I'm a clone, just cause I died a long time ago? How can we be sure that you're not one, as well? I mean, you've also been dust for a while, right? Perdita smiled. As a matter of fact, I am one. A certain group was kind enough to put me back together. My organs are cloned, most of my limbs are cybernetic, but all of my brain is my own. She smiled. A slight exaggeration, but no need to let them know that. And I'm supposed to give information to a freak like you. No way. You don't have a choice, clone boy. If you won't give me what I want, I'll drag it out of you with the proper equipment. Why don't you just come peacefully? Ran must stay here, said Shampoo. Only if the company operates, my geriatric Amazon. Otherwise, I'm afraid he'll have to accompany me to the executioner's office. Now, wait a minute. Shampoo narrowed her eyes and crouched into a combat stance. Shampoo, you really don't need to. Too late. The Amazon slipped into full fighter mode and rushed at Perdita, performing a new attack she'd taught herself a variation on the flying chestnut fists which was not as fast, but twice as powerful. Nabiki blocked. Shampoo didn't know how she did it, but every one of her blows was precisely countered. Not a single one of the hundreds she attempted was able to connect. Give it up, said the self-proclaimed cyborg. You're 80 years too late to defeat me. Again, that unnerving smile. That awful grin made Shampoo want to bash her teeth in. And she would have, too, if she'd been able to hit. Tired from a full minute of continuous performance of the special attack, Shampoo fell into a crouch, and breathed heavily. Maybe Nabiki was right. If she couldn't hit, even with that strike, maybe she was getting too old. The self-proclaimed cyborg stepped forward slowly. It was a mistake to lay your hands on me, Shampoo. One leg in front of the other, methodically, mechanically. Normally I can't attack, but since you initiated combat, almost as if fighting some invisible drag, she pressed onwards, while the Amazon merely narrowed her eyes and tensed her muscles. 
I am being threatened by your actions, Shampoo. My existence is at stake. Perdita raised her arm and prepared to strike when she was herself struck down. Every circuit in her seemed to burst at the same time, paralyzing her with agonizing pain. Her limbs twitched violently, sending her into a caricature of a waltz, while the others watched. She saw them with only partly functioning eyes, that flipped randomly through the spectra first the warm tones of infrared, then the cold of UV scans, down to their bones from the beta scan, and more. But in all these modes, she was puzzled, for though they were surprised, they seemed, they seemed to have expected this. Slowly, the bolts of pain began to fuse and expand, until they covered her whole anatomy, supplanting all other sensory information. Her vision, too, grew blurred, only to focus again, but, within, she turned her head, trying to see, and she saw, but not what was outside, not what was real. Images floated past her, from her nightmares. Kasumi, Akan, the doctor, and Belladonna. Then images, images that couldn't be, twisted dreams that saw her guiltless, but worse than that, that cursed her to a futile death, and to a meaningless, if blameless life after. She shook her head, trying to rid herself of the tempting illusions, but it only made it worse. It'd be so easy, it made such sense. But, they changed. From her past, to the present. The Thompson girl, and the Bosun Kuzi. They looked at her, the gay and angrily and the pale one with, with evil. What? But I don't. What's happening to me? The girl with the white stripe threw her hair pulled out a golden dagger, and raised it high before sending it crashing down to be caught by Ranma. Thompson's image flickered, turning to Sodom's, and back, furiously, violently, until she couldn't tell which one she was looking at. And then there was Ockhan, in the dress she'd died in. What? just drudged from the river, and beckoning. Beckoning her to join her, teasing her, gesturing towards the Ranma half before her. Nabiki Tendo raised her arm to touch her sister's hand. P -R -D -I -D -A. At the sound of her new name, there was a flash, and with it went the pain, the memories and the visions. The cyborg dropped to her knees and breathed heavily, exhausted. After a few seconds, she looked up. Hi. What are you doing here? I, I was just here to visit Uncle Antacid. Uncle Antacid? He works here, and I thought I'd... Wait. Aren't you the one who should be explaining? You were about to attack and shampoo. And shampoo? Listen, kiddo, I might buy the Uncle Antacid boy. The jolt Suzoku must be desperate for names, but I doubt he's married to that. To that. She plumped that shampoo, but her voice trailed off as she noticed she and ran staring at her. Clearing her throat. She stood up and smoothed her clothes. I just call them aunt and uncle. It's really just a type of affection. Hi. You know crazy maniac woman? Champa seemed indignant. Ranma seemed confused. I work with her. At the Perdita glared at her. I work with her. Care to tell me exactly why you came to the Nako and at one in the morning? Perdita said, suspicion in her voice. 
You're not the only one who works odd hours, and I have to visit family when I can. Care to tell me the same, Dida? Perdid grunted. I was hungry for Raymond. Uh-huh. Whatever. Look, what do you say we forget about all this and head back to the K? Another glare. To work? She grinned. I'm sure Andy can make us some Raymond to take back. Right? Shampoo nodded in silence. But her eyes seemed less than amused. University of Tokyo Commerce Building Basement I was hungry for Raymond. Uh -huh. Whatever. Look, what do you say we forget about this and head back to the K? To work? I'm sure Andy can make us some Raymond to take back. Right? That's enough for me, Tay, said Zvanon, a broad smile across her face. Set the rest on record and I'll watch it in the morning. It is the morning. The afternoon, then. I need my beauty sleep. Very well. They tapped a few buttons and the view screen went dark. I must admit, she said, that it's quite a relief Perdita seems to know nothing about the jump. A big relief. I'm afraid I'm not all that up on my genetics. Oh. Any ideas about that clone? Now that I know Shampoo is involved, it shouldn't be too difficult to obtain the information we need. Puru placed her elbows on her desk and cradled her chin in her hands. Something bothering you? A lot of things. Like what? We don't know who or what jumped, true? But considering it's the Nakeful Adam, it's probably some old Chinese artifact that caused it. And if it's magical, there shouldn't be too much trouble correcting the... That's not what I'm talking about. What, then? It's... Nothing, really. Just... I'll be fine. I just need to be alone. If you say so. Svanon got off the couch and walked to the door. If you need me... You know where to find me. I'm always there, if you want someone to talk to. Thank you, Svanon. And, I'm sorry I snapped at you earlier. I should have trusted you more than that. Puru waved the apology away. You did what you had to. It certainly looked like the mirror. The Hibiki nodded. I'll send Childra to investigate later, she said, then stepped through the door, and tapped it shut lightly. They sat in the darkness for a few minutes, unmoving. There was a lot to consider, a lot to analyze and work on. She didn't want to be hasty, but now that she knew, she'd suspected, of course, and feared it. But, here was testimony from so many sources, so many undeniable sources. Tendo Perdida was Tendo Nzabiki. Tendo Nzabiki was Tendo Perdida. Her fears, her hopes had both come to life, and in one and the same body. It was difficult to deal with, but she'd try. She'd try. With a sigh. She turned on her desktop computer and began to scan the databases. A new game was beginning, and she had to plan her strategy. After making sure the hover car was out of visual range out of enhanced visual range the girl hopped down from her branch and dusted herself off, Wishing she'd worn something a bit more substantial than her synthetic black bodysuit to protect her from the cold. Oh, well, couldn't be helped. When stealth was required, one had to make two. 
In any case, the information she had obtained was more than worth the trouble. If nothing else, there seemed to be some way of disabling the Anocorp cyborgs, or some fatal flaw in their programming. And it had been a grotesque spectacle to watch, but a fruitful one. With a smile on her face, she started back uptown, singing an old tune in a sweet alto voice. But shall I go mourn for that, my dear? The pale moon shines by night, and when I wander here and there, I then do most go right. If tinkers may have leave to live and bear the so skin budget, then my account I well may give and in the stocks about it. And asterisk chapter 31 asterisk, Night Terrors Night Terrors Aranma 2096 Side Story by Jason L. Jaikung Lang Lois R. 2096 Characters and Situations Used with Permission. Takahashi's aren't. You, you don't belong here. Ah can winced at the words, words she had feared since she had met the ghost descendant. Skaraid, let me, Skaraid's face twisted in sadness and anger. No! She screamed it out of despair more than anything. No, Tendo, you've tricked me long enough. You don't belong here. In a fluid motion born from much practice, she pulled her perbushals from its hidden sheath. Tears began to well in her eyes. I trusted you, Akhan. I believed you were of the living. I thought of you as my friend. The dagger flowed in Skaride's hand, changing positions as skillfully as any martial artist may have caused it to. With a scream of rage and a fluid motion, Skaride lunged, swiping the blade across Akhan's belly. Only her training saved her. As the living girl lunged, Akhan jumped back. Still, she felt the barest of scratches, and chanced to look down. He dress was slit neatly, horizontally along her torso. A light green line of key was only now dissipating across the bare portion of her stomach. Skaride! Please, don't do this! Akhan pleaded, not wanting to face this confrontation. If only she had not tried to comfort the living girl. She had been walking, affording Ranma his sleep, and leaving King carefully gripping a pencil in her ghostly fingers. Akhan giggled, remembering King's question before she left. He wouldn't wake up if I switched back, would he? In Akhan's remembrance of his first curse, she had to answer no. She was walking in the park when she heard a sob. It sounded familiar, but she attributed it to her own experience with tears. She had shed many after Ranma died, both living and dead. She stepped into the clearing, her curiosity having gotten the best of her. She recognized the rising tear-streaked face of the girl too late. Oh, re Akhan. Akhan was trying to back away, but was caught by the girl's stricken voice. Despite all the warnings blaring in her mind, she stepped once toward her. Are you all right, Skaride? Skaride looked away. I am FF fine. Akhan. Her trembling lip told another story. Akhan again ignored her instincts. She stepped closer, and spoke soothingly. Do you want to talk about it? For a moment she thought Skaride was going to decline. But then tears welled up in her eyes, and she began sobbing into her hands. I'll love it. 
person, and he, he doesn't love me. Akan's ah heart went out to the girl. She remembered those feelings too well. She had spent many a night feeling the same way about Ranma. She made the one mistake she had avoided all this time. Her hand went out and touched Skaride's shoulder. Skaride jumped as if jolted with 10,000 volts. She looked at Akan, her expression a mixture of awe, understanding, and disappointment. Then she said the words Akan had been dreading since she realized her mistake. You do not belong here. The screen tore Akan from her painful memory and forced her concentration on the reluctant battle she was fighting. Skaride, please, come down. Skaride's face was a mass of fury her hair blowing in the building wind. Calm down. One of the people I thought of his friend, who I poured my very soul out to, is unliving, and you want me to calm down? The daggers arc sliced ribbons between them. Tendo Akhan, you do not belong. You have made a mockery of me and my quest. Prepare to end. Spirit, come on, King, we gotta find her. Ranma floated impatiently beside a grumpy King Thompson. Why in the world did you have to wake up anyways, Jock? Ranma floated toward her. I told you it didn't have to be that hot, tomboy. You'd wake up too, if you'd nearly been boiled alive. Kim looked down at her red arm. She had forgotten for the umpteenth time that they would switch places when the water hit. But why do we have to look for your fiancé, anyway? Ranma looked impatient, following his newfound senses. His night with Akhan, when they had consummated their engagement, left him with a sense for her that had rivaled his awareness as a martial artist. He could now feel her when she was near, even when he was flesh. He could even feel a touch of her when she was away, but only as a ghost. Usually, the feeling felt warm as the loving emotion brushed him, like a kiss, or hot when he still, after all these years angered her. Right now it felt cold with fear, so strong it was twisting his stomach. Akhan's in trouble. He said it with such certainty that King felt no more compunction to argue. As they neared the park, they could hear the sounds of a woman. Fighting. Ranma's face went pale as he felt Akhan's emotions. She's close. You're only making this harder on yourself, spirit. As they broke through the clearing, Kim saw Skaride wielding a wickedly sharp-looking dagger in her right hand. Ranma's gasp told her Akhan was there as well. Skaride, don't. Ranma was already running toward them. He jumped into the dagger's path. Arms outspread, as it crashed toward Akhan. Lightning flashed, and it began to rain, heavily. Skarai blinked, having barely stopped the knife's descent when she saw the blur in her field of vision before the lightning blinded her. She blinked twice as King Thompson stood before her, eyes shut, arms outstretched before Akhan who had been knocked backwards by one of Skaride's swipes. Her eyes narrowed to dangerous slits. Kim, get out of my way. Kim opened her eyes, looked briefly surprised, then shockily strengthened her stance. Skaride, come on, think things through. Her plan was dangerous, 
She knew, but she took the chance anyway. I saw Ken, saw that you were going to hurt her. As far as you know, I can't see ghosts, can I? Sky blinked. It made sense. And this hunt was not as fulfilling as her others. But something wasn't quite right here. Why you saw her? Kim looked behind her. Ah Ken's eyes were wide, her hair stringing down in her face from the rain. She was breathing hard, looking as frightened as a rabbit and... Wait. Her hair was wet. As Kim began to put it together, so did Akan and Skaride. Akan, having 100 years experience as a ghost, as well as advice from children, almost automatically changed her hair to gradually get wet. Kim didn't have that experience or advice. Skaride reached out a hand and touched Kim's shoulder. No. Her anger and shock threatened to engulf her, and violet Kai raged from her body. Not you. I cannot. I will not. Lose Reraku to a spirit. Her knife flowed back comma and with a piercing screech, began its deadly path to King's heart. A path interrupted by a strong hand on her tiny wrist. I don't think so. Skaride struggled against Ranma's strong grip. Let me go. They don't belong. Her screeches hit Ranma's ears unheeded. He felt Akan's relief, and tried to reach out for her with his own feelings. It's okay, now, Akan. Perhaps it was Ranma's attempt to relax Akhan, causing him to relax his grip. Perhaps it was Skaride's tiny wrists, or her frantic struggles. Perhaps it was merely fate. Whatever the reason, Skaride's head broke Ranma's grip and swung wildly behind her. A scream caught in Akhan's throat as King's was torn wide open. Kim looked at Ranma, dumbfounded, and her eyes widened as she faded from existence. Akan looked to Ranma, and was met with the most horrible sight she could imagine. Ranma was on his knees, clutching his gushing throat. He collapsed in a pool of blood, his eyes wide in a look of horrified shock. The memories of 100 years ago played themselves back. Akan knelt, weeping next to her Ranma, her Ayanasuk. As he breathed his last, she slowly lifted his head to her lap. Ranma. No, please, don't leave me alone again. Ranma's hand reached toward her key wet face. It fell limp as his dying breath gurgled from his wound. Tendo Akan looked toward the darkened heavens, and screamed her loss to the clouds. Yay! Akan bolted upright from her position on the floor. A split second later, a firm hand touched her shoulder. She screamed again. Akan. She turned, shaking, and met the eyes of Ranma. Her trembling hand slowly made its way to his worried face. She burst into joyful tears when it connected. Oh. Ranma. Her sobs became more frantic, and she began to stroke Ranma's face in earnest, as if to convince herself that he was real. Ranma, perplexed, could only hold her gently until her sobs subsided. Thin Asterisk Chapter 32 Asterisk, 
My terrors I the phone rang on the desk. After a few moments, the man behind it grew tired of ignoring it, and picked up the receiver. Miller. He listened briefly to the person on the other end, then sighed and began to make his report. Elsewhere. Excellent. Everything is proceeding as planned. You to still insist on going through this mad course of action? If you don't like it, I'm sure Miller would be more than happy to take your place, Hitatsu. I seriously doubt it, Mitsuko. He's one of ours. Excuse me. Can we please get back to the plan? Yes, let's. What did Miller report, Fuditsu? The Wanderer has been warned, by our envoy herself. She has begun her attempts to locate Sable. How so? She is currently trying to locate Childra Jansen in order to see exactly how much of an effect their encounter had on him. And what of the assassin? Calm yourself, Hitatsu. After Fuditsu and I are through with her, Skyride will be extremely weary of approaching our envoy. My terrors I yet another offering from the Anything Goes School of Indiscriminate Fanfic Writing written by Aaron Mills edited by 4CW6 Ranma2096 characters used with permission. To die, to sleep, to sleep. Perchance to dream. W-I-L-L-I-A-M Shakespeare Hamlet, Act I-I-I Scene 1 Scaride collapsed on her bed, exhausted. Who would best a new 20th century history professor would assign such extensive reading on her first day in class? And she seemed so dop 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 well dop 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 cold dop already there were rumors flying about on campus about how Nino Sensei despised the text the university provided, calling it romanticized bullshit. It was almost, some said, as if she had lived through the 20th century knew exactly what was incorrect in the text and hated the researchers for it. Skyride didn't mind. The prof seemed nice enough, if a little vehement about how getting the facts of history was one of the most important things a researcher needed to do. And anyone who cared that much about history clearly cared about the subject, so she couldn't be blamed for wanting her students to get the truth. Regardless, Skyride hoped that the length of the readings wouldn't be a regular feature of the course. She yawned. 300 pages in today's was a lot of information to digest. Coupled with her regular rounds of Tokyo, she was looking forward to a good night's rest. As she prepared for bed, an interesting thought struck her. When she had first seen Mino Hyaginako, there was a familiarity about her that had plagued the Gosunkuji through the class. The feelings had vanished when she left class, so she'd given them no further thought, but Skaraid thought about the professor. Nino Hyaksensei was in her mid-thirties. She had long brown hair that came to her waist. She typically dressed in black slacks, a black button-down blouse and a red sports jacket. Around her throat she wore a delicate white scarf, and the entire ensemble was topped off by a pair of round, purple-tinted spectacles. She spoke very eloquently, but there was something in the accent in her tone, perhaps just a hint of the dialect used in Kansai's. Another puzzling thing was the way she appeared to vanish in the throng of people in the hallway of the building just after class. 
Several other students had reported witnessing this same phenomena. If it weren't for the fact that the other students could see her, Skaride could sworn that the new instructor was a ghost. She climbed into bed, laughing at herself for such a silly thought. Of course the new instructor was alive. No ghost had that much power. She pulled the covers over herself and was soon in a deep sleep. Now, Skaride opened her eyes. She was back in the old Nirima graveyard the same one she had exorcised the mysterious spatula wielding Hibiki at nearly three years earlier. She stood up and looked down to find herself dressed in her hunting clothes the red and black bodysuit and her school jacket. However, as she noticed when she looked down, her per bushels was missing. This disturbed her. She felt naked without her knife at her side when she went on a hunt. Granted, she still had the bubble to fall back on, but it was comforting to know she had a backup if necessary. She began wandering through the graveyard, looking for the gate but it seemed that no matter where she turned all she saw were rows upon rows of granite blocks. She briefly wondered if this was how Rarok had felt whenever he tried to find his way somewhere. Figuring that she would be bound to find the graveyard's boundary sooner or later, she set off in a random direction. After a few minutes it became clear that she she'd gone the wrong way. The only thing in this part of the yard was a lone marker overgrown with weeds and vines. And yet, it seemed familiar, like she had seen it before. Skaride surveyed the landscape. Yes, she had seen this area before. There was the crypt she had cornered Takei in. She'd finally obliterated him last year. Ah, sweet revenge. Using that as a reference point, she stood on the steps of the crypt and looked around. Now, if I was standing here, then the gravestone over there would have been. Cold bread ran through her veins like ice. Top, top, top the grave where the Hibiki came from. But it was destroyed. As she studied the stone for a moment, a new feeling emerged. I wonder if the name is readable. Skaride approached the marker, with the excitement of three years of curiosity about to be relieved. She had always wondered which Hibiki it was that she had vanquished despite the fact that she still felt guilty about exorcising one of Raraku's ancestors. She knelt down next to the stone and began to shut and yank the vegetation out of her way. When she finally was able to read the stone, the moon took that opportunity to vanish behind some clouds leaving her unable to read the inscription on the black stone. Maybe I can feel it. She placed a hand on the marker and began tracing the carved characters on the stone. You dot 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 key dot sing a glowing projectile embedded itself in the stone, whistling past Skaride's ear and illuminating the name. Skaride. Unfortunately, Tag whirled around to see where the projectile had come from. No. Standing not fifty meters from her was the spirit of the Hibiki she had vanquished, her giant spatula at the ready. Green flames of key surrounded her body, and her eyes glowed with a red deeper than that of the skin of a conquering Dachinite. Skaride scrambled to her feet. Or at least, she tried to. Don't bother, said the ghost. A tongue of key burst from the aura of the spirit, 
surrounding the assassin. Scaride found herself being crushed in a vice-like grip. The breath was squeezed from her lungs as she thought to escape from the key field. The Hibiki walked over to her and looked the girl over. You and I have some unfinished business, said the spirit. You are gone. I destroyed you. You hyphen hyphen gone single quote T belong here. Finished the Hibiki. Sorry, sugar, but you've used that line on me before. Get some new material. Fun. What do you want of me? Scaride demanded, trying to keep face in spite of her increasing terror. I knew she had power, but I never dreamed she was this powerful. To kill you? What else? The spirit shrugged. She gestured behind her. You see? They would like to have a word with you. Scaride looked behind the ghost to see them. The hundreds of shades she had put to rest. Some were enveloped in purple key fields, others had glowing red scars on portions of their anatomy, all were demanding revenge. Revenge on her soul. You've annoyed quite a few people, Gosankuji. Quite a few. In fact, I would say that the chances of being sent to a place of eternal torment are quite good. The spatula ghost put an arm around Skyride and leaned into whispering her ear. And I am the one who is going to send you there. She sheathed her combat spatula and produced one of the smaller ones. As I recall, I told you to go to hell. The blade of the spatula came to Skaride's throat. The congregation of spirits began cheering wildly. Dob 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 let me, Kwanji Yukayu, be the first to say welcome. And with that, Yukayu slashed the throat of her killer. Hang oh 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 oh. Skaride sat up with a start. Moonlight poured into her window. She felt the covers clenched tightly in her hands, then released them slowly, wiping the sweat from her brow. Just a dream. A dream, but a very significant one. A premonition. Could she have returned? Impossible. There was no escape from oblivion. In the Dharma realm there was no consciousness. No self to conceive a return. Emptiness and selfhood were incompatible ideas. Where there was one imperfection, the other could not exist. And with her own hands, with her own life energy she ensured the total dissipation of the specters. Still, the fact remained. She dreamed of her, and the dream was a nightmare. Was it guilt that brought this spirit to her mind now, after so many years? Was it regret? Was it a figment of her own subconscious, trying to find a way to deal with her affection for her cousin? Careful, Nutkin. Scaride's mind danced with mental images from a foreign book she had read long ago. You might be in undigest a bit of beef there's more of gravy than of grave about you. There was danger in underestimating the messages of the spirit realm, and the speaker of those words had learned his lesson threefold. The assassin would not make the same mistake. She would be wary, and investigate rather than assuming as too many often did in proud conceit and selfishness, that such omens were the product of their own minds. But first, she needed rest. Scaride lay back down and forced herself to relax, trying to get the adrenaline out of her system. Her concentration soon paid off as she grew drowsy and hovered on the verge of sleep. 
While she was falling into slumber, a memory from the dream crept into her thoughts. A name. Kwan Jiu Kaiyu. I was a name she intended to find out more about. You failed, Mitsuko. Now she's even more determined to find out about the envoy. Are you sure about that, Hitatsu? What? You mean to say that this is exactly what we wanted to happen? The assassin is about to learn that death isn't always an absolute, even for the second time. You're mad. Is it mad to ensure our success? Skaride needs to be taken from active consideration. Killing her is not on our list of options, so... So? I believe the term is rematch. Now I know you are mad. What if the envoy loses again? Then, Hitatsu, we are out of a job. If we shadows have offended, think but this, and all is mended, that you have but slumbered here while these visions did appear. And this weekend I have a theme, no more yielding but a dream. W-I-L-L-I-A-M Shakespeare A Midsummer Night's Dream, Act V Scene 1 to be continued. Asterisk Chapter 33 Asterisk, Confessions and Revelations Confessions and Revelations Written by Jason Jacob Langlois and Aaron Mills Ranma 2096 Characters Used with Permission when I touch you like this and you hold me like that I just have to admit that it's all coming back to me. J.I.M. Steinman, it's all coming back to me now, he crouched, unaffected by the driving rain, as most of the spirit world was. He knew she would show herself on this night of ghostly activity. Tonight, the hunter would become the hunted. So swore Hibiki Ryuga. As he waited with the patience of the spirit world, his thoughts wandered back to his reunion with his wife. Inwardly, he shivered. He hadn't seen that look in her eyes since the time he had visited her after. After he and Nabiki. The look in her eyes. The cold look of a woman who had finally seen the very depths of betrayal, had forced him to flee from his own life, a woman he would have willingly given his life for all those years ago. When he had seen her again, he discovered he would have given his afterlife for her, too. If only, if he hadn't betrayed her, taken advantage of a situation fueled by mental fatigue and frustration. If he hadn't dishonored himself, his son, his wife, maybe then, they could have both been happy, both gone on to the afterlife they were meant to, even, even gone on together, instead of being cursed to walk the earth in vaporous form. At one dalliance, at one moment of weakness with Nabiki, his thoughts drowned in shame, even after all these years. That mark on his honor was one of the reasons, he believed, he had been doomed to wander the earth. He shook his head, impatient with his own reverie. He would not fail her this time. He would make up for his past failings, or at least, one of them. He looked to the trap, looked at the bait awaiting there, glowing, and shuddered. Maneko stood, or floated, actually, just above her now repaired gravestone. She glowed with her own ghostly essence. But the look of timid joy she felt in helping her still living family had been replaced with a look of cold resignation. She herself had come to Ryugli after he began his search. Wanderer, 
I wish to repay you for saving me from the assassin. Her timidity was gone, but her eyes. Ryuga noticed then, her eyes were cold and dark. Stolic. I wish to help you find her. But, there must be a condition. He had then seen the barest flicker of emotion. Pain flashed in her eyes. You must let her exorcise me. Ryuga had nearly refused. But the pain in her eyes. It reminded him of Yukainu the day they had discovered she would not be released from the Institute. Even now the memory burned him with anger and disgust. Instead of the refusal already nearly past his lips, he had asked for an explanation. The pain flashed. Flared into her eyes as she began her story. I had been home all night. Yakum. He hadn't. I was waiting for him, just to see him. Though she thought it, Ryuga could see by her trembling lips and what glow near her eyes that her heart had been crushed. When he came home, he was with another. He didn't ask her to go home after she had stopped her tears. He agreed, both to let her lead him to the proper place, and to allow her to be exorcised by Skaride. He had no intention of keeping that second promise. The rain abated, and Ryuga shifted slightly, more out of habit than any discomfort. She would come soon. It was nearly impossible to resist, the shining ghost hovering, a spirit that had once escaped her clutches, nearly visible to even the least perceptive. On Friday the 14th, she would come soon. The voice that rang out proved it. The time it has come. Maneko started, then righted herself as Skaride let the shadows fall from her. So, Maneko, we meet again. The smugness in the assassin's voice turned Ryuga's spiritual stomach, but he held. Not until after. Not until she starts the exorcism. Skaride was in a talkative mood, perhaps pleased with herself that she had found this missed opportunity again. I see you've seen your husband lately, she practically bird, already beginning to glow wild. Ryuga tensed in readiness. Maneko's voice wavered. But she did not break. Do what you will, assassin, she spat. I no longer belong here. That seemed to touch the cord with Skaride. Her eyes darkened dangerously. You never belong here. The voice was barely above a whisper, but reached the ghostly ears with venom. She raised her hands and allowed the sphere to glow. Suddenly, she smiled again. I hope you aren't too attached to your little boy's new mother. I told you, I had much experience in mind control. Real is how tie on it Maneko just before Skaride released her soul trap. It hit Ryuga seconds before. He stood. As there, he never got to finish his shout. A green flash blinded him for a short second. When he opened his eyes again, Yukaihu stood before him, anger distorting her features. Ryugu looked around, realizing that the three of them were no longer at the cemetery, but on the roof of the administration building of the university. Across the roof Maneko was looking around. Confused, Yukai glared at Ryuga, glowing brightly. Her words were calm, but the chill in them caused every sense in him to grow arctically cold. I told you to stay out of my way. Ryuga looked up at his former spouse. He was, 
for the first time in decades, speechless. Ukiah glanced at his dumbfounded expression with an displeased contempt. Scarite is mine, she growled. No one gets to her before I do. Do you understand me? No one. This is your second warning, Ryuga. Three strikes and you're out. The envoy turned to leave. Ryuga found his voice. So, you're here to deal with her then? I thought it had something to do with another son we supposedly had. Yukai turned. No, I'm not here to deal with her. That's a little bonus task I've set for myself. As for the rest, I've already told you everything I can. Not that I expect you to care. I do care. Ryuga protested. I care about you. I want to help you. Oh, gotcha. He was cut off by a quick slap across the face. When he looked up, red light was pouring from Yukaihu's eyes. Don't you ever call me that again, she said bitterly. You lost your rights to call me that when you stopped coming to see me, when you threw me out for the others. Others? Ryuga repeated. What others? There was only Nabik. Ryuga clapped a hand over his own mouth, realizing what he had just said. Hibiki taunted an inner voice. You haven't any brain. You Kaihu's earth had shrunk to near nothing. The shadows hid her face from view. So, she thought, that was her little mission of mercy that time. She was already sleeping with my husband, so she came to laugh at me. Laugh at me for being so stupid. And I sat there and listened to it. She raised her face to meet Ryuga's. Whore. Ryuga blinked. Now I, you're a whore. You slept with Nebuki, and she gave you her company in payment. A company with enough power to get me away from Takamatsai and his thugs, and you did nothing. You had wealth and influence, and yet you did nothing with it. You just loafed around, enjoying your wealth. You are a poor, Ryuga. You are a prostitute. I did try. But Kaiuthu had me in a deadlock. I couldn't get you out. And after Nebuki died, it took months to get all the paperwork signed and settled. I tried. Oh, you tried, did you? She knelt down next to her ex-husband. Shall I tell you of what I went through while I foolishly wait for you? Shall I tell you of the innumerable combination of drugs Takamatsai prescribed for me, so I couldn't tell what was real and what wasn't? Shall I tell you of how every day the orderlies would come in with scalpels and tubes and other surgical equipment and make off with parts of me? Her expression darkened and her tone dropped to a whisper. Shall I tell you of how after the samples were taken, the orderlies would take special privileges with me? Ryuga looked at her in shock. Okay, Yukaiu, you mean you were? Yukaiu looked up sharply, remembered tears glistening in the corner of her eyes. Where were you? She asked. Ryuga's mind flashed back to that one letter the one he had received after the visit stopped. His heart broke all over again. He turned, the shame renewed, not able to look at her face. I couldn't face you, he whispered. Yukaihu's own cold voice struck his back as if he hadn't said anything. Where were you when? 
when I cried at night because I just wanted to be home. Her voice began to tremble. When I woke up screaming because you were next to me. Where were you then, Ryuga? Her voice, sharp with pain and bitterness, pierced the core of Ryuga's heart. You were... You were playing out your Tendo fantasies at home. Ryuga's pun, anger and horror flashing through his eyes. His teeth were clenched, his jaw muscles working in almost a human reflection of his frustration. No. No, you Kaiyu. I wasn't playing out my Tendo fantasies. You really want to know where I was? She met his dark gaze with a look of defiance, daring him to tell her the truth. I was failing. I was trying to get you out of that damned place, back home where you belonged, and I was failing with every step I took. Yukai looked at his trembling body with utter contempt. Right. How convenient that the only thing you tried was the corpse. The look that pinned Yukai to the ground also tightened her throat around her accusation. The pain in Ryuga's voice nearly crumbled the walls she built around her heart, the hatred she'd felt for him since. To her surprise, she could no longer remember. Ryuga's voice was strained. His breathing, though not required, rapid and shallow. You Kaiyu, you sit there and think you have it all figured out. You think I forgot you, that it was easy for me to lie in that huge bed and feel empty space where there was warmth once. You think it was easy. If so, you're a bigger fool than I am. Yukaiyu's mouth opened in anger, but snapped shut as he continued. I did try to break you out. I was all ready. I saw you asleep. All I could think about was getting you out, holding you, and telling you how much I'd wished I'd done this sooner. Then, Kaiyu showed up. He was surrounded by four of the orderlies big guys. One was that officer whose arm I broke. He told me. Ryuga's voice caught, the remembered failure draining his resolve. He told me he'd blacklist Kyoku if I tried anything. He told me I couldn't visit you until they did a review. I, I decided to get Nebuki to help me. Yukaiyu's anger flooded, almost to the level it had been before. Why not? She was already helping you in other ways. What are you talking about? She used me. She hurt Kasumi and blamed me for it. She seduced me, made me betray you, also she could get what she wanted. Yukai looked in his eyes. One thing she remembered about Ryuga came crashing to the surface of her thoughts. Hibiki Ryuga may have his faults, but he's never lied to you. She mentally kicked herself for even wasting her time with him. Jay just stay out of my way, Ryo Ryuga. She stood and began to walk off. Leave Skyride to me. Leave it all to me. She halted as words struck her back. Running away, Oko-chan. She stopped dead in her tracks. I told you, don't ever call me that again. Her words were forced, quiet, but she knew Ryuga heard. I told you, you don't deserve to call me that. Not when you slept with Nebuki. Not when you walked out on me. The words sounded hollow to her in the face of his own words. But one last memory blasted past her lips, 
the pain too much to even try to hold it back. Not when you didn't even show up on my last birthday. Ryuga's own voice, also a whisper, floated on the breeze to her. The sadness and hurt in that small whisper reminded her of the pain she felt when she visited the graves of his former love and her fiancé. I did. Yukai turned and faced her dob 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 husband. No, it had been far too many years for her to allow herself to call him that. Tag he. Tag he actually visited her. No, she replied quietly. I remember. You didn't show up. No, you're right. Ryugi admitted. Yukaiu began to feel her spiritual heart sink. I arrived the next day. In the afternoon. They, they told me you died the night before. And still... Still Takamatsu refused to let me see you. As if you were still a danger to his precious institute. Yukaiu returned to Ryuga's side. What? She swallowed. What did you do? Kaiuthu no longer had a hold on me, so I busted my way in and rescued you. Ryuga dashed down the corridors of the Institute, Yukaiu's body cradled in his arms. Tears were streaming down his face. They had taken her from him. His wife. They had taken one of the kindest, gentlest souls he'd ever met in his years of aimless wandering and destroyed her. There had been an old saying which had been altered somewhat in Japan over the last few decades, Hell hath no fury like a hibiki scorned. Ryuga had already left three guards with broken limbs, another two would need full body casts and as for the ex-cop that wanted the rematch. Well... They were making wonderful new advances in respirator technology. Ryugu wasn't stupid, however. He had taken care to disguise himself in the tattered brown cloak and goggles he'd used while wandering in the desert before he'd arrived in Shikaku. The black clothing was an added help. He was almost out. There was only one other thing he needed to do. The door to Takamatsai's office exploded. Bits of steel reinforced wood showered the office proper. Takamatsai instinctively hit the floor, trying to avoid the shower of building materials. He cowered under his desk as he heard someone enter the room. There was a rustle of leather as something was laid on the sofa. Then a pair of black shoes came into his field of vision. The feet were plonked away from him, then turned, and again so they were facing him. The desk was suddenly ripped away, bathing Takamatsai in brightness. He squinted upward at the cloaked figure that was silhouetted against the picture window of his office. The figure reached down, and hoisted the not-so-good doctor up by the collar of his coat until he was nose-to-nose -nose with the goggled assailant. The lenses of the goggles were mirror-tinted, so Takamatsai could only see his fat, terrified, middle-aged face in them. Know this, the figure said in a harsh whisper. I will return, and put an end to all the misery and suffering you've caused. She, the figure gestured at the body of Hibiki Yukainu that was laying on the sofa. We'll be your last victim. With this, his assailant dropped Takamak's eyes picked up the body and dug through the window. Three days later, Hibiki Yukai was buried. The engraving on the marker said simply Sumimasen. Yukai studied Ryuga. He cared, 
He really did care. She believed him now. He did care for her. Why else would he do such a thing for her? But still, there was a part of her that refused to believe it, that felt he was still hiding something. It was this part that prompted her to ask her next question. Why are you here, Ryuga? Don't tell me it was to become the champion of Nirima's dead. What happened? Did you get lost again? Her attempt at humor fell flat. Ryuga tensed. What to do? Dare he tell her that he'd gotten lost because he'd seen Akhan at the side of his body as he was leaving? Or should he just say that he'd gotten lost? Ryuga struggled with a dilemma he'd not dealt with since he was a teenager. He decided he wouldn't lie to her again. The words came out on their own. I stayed because dot 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 I saw Akhan as I was leaving. The original phrase was hell half no fury like a woman scorned. And in Yukaithu's case, it was quite literal. The green key flames returned, burning with a fury he had only seen when she had first returned to Tokyo. So, was all she said. Ryuga watched as his former spouse walked across the roof to Maneko. The two women spoke for a while, then he watched Yukaiu raise a hand above Maneko's head. Within moments, Maneko was surrounded by a field of green key. After a moment, Maneko became a mere shadow inside the field. And when the field faded, there was no trace of the spirit. Ryuga stood and walked over to where Yukai was preparing to leave. He placed a hand on her arm. Yukai, please. Yukai stiffened as if to throw his arm off, then relaxed. Her next words came out quietly. I've sent Maneko to where she needs to be. She turned to look at the wanderer. I don't want to see you anymore, Ryuga. But if you insist on interfering, dot 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 our other son's name is Sable. With that, there was a second flash and Ryuga found himself back in the cemetery. He was conscious of only one thought. I've lost her. I've lost the only woman I've ever truly loved. No. I refuse to let that happen. I love her, and she loves me. She's just forgotten. Forgotten how much she meant to me. I must find a way to prove my love. After a moment, an idea came into his head. Yukaihu stared at the spot Ryuga had been standing in, before she sent him away. Despite his confession, she had not sent him away in anger. I don't love him anymore. That's the truth of it, isn't it? I've fallen out of love with him. Then why did I tell him Sable's name? Do I truly want his help? I I the tears began to form again, and Yukai closed her eyes as the sun began to come up over the horizon. Then, quiet as a breath of wind that blows through a meadow, she spoke, Ryo Chan. To repeat tonight's top story, the historic Tokyo Institute for the Criminally Insane was destroyed today in an explosion of unknown origin. The former mental hospital and now museum was completely obliterated in what some are beginning to call an act of God. Thin.